Hello and welcome to the Day Health Strategies podcast, Unlocking Accountable Care, the healthcare podcast where we talk everything value-based care with the top experts in the field. Welcome back and thank you for joining us for another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care. As always, I'm Max Blumenthal and I'm joined by Day Health Strategies Senior Consultant, Sarah bliss Matusik. Okay, Max, I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about today. But first, let me ask you a question. What would you say if I told you that the medical care that patients receive is estimated to account for only 10 to 20% of what actually contributes to healthy outcomes for patients? Hmm. So you're saying that the medical treatment and all the money we spend at the hospital isn't really what contributes to people's health? So what makes up the other 80%? Well, the other 80 to 90% are what we call social determinants of health, meaning things outside of traditional medical treatment. The majority of healthcare we provide patients is really just band-aids to fix problems that crop up for people, but the social determinants of health look upstream at the underlying environmental, political, social, and economic factors that cause people to get sick in the first place. Now, the World Health Organization defines social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. This is one reason why health outcomes in third world countries are poorer than in the developed world. So it sounds to me like social determinants of health are often things that people don't have control over like where they live, their race, or the economic or social position that their family is born into. I get that these conditions impact health, but how can the healthcare system think about tackling these complex problems? I'm glad you asked. One of the goals of shifting away from fee-for-service to value-based care has been precisely to align incentives for healthcare providers to start paying attention to the whole patient beyond the simple ailment that's brought them into that office on that given day. So the social determinants, for example. In ACOs, providers are held accountable for all healthcare outcomes, and so they must consider all the factors that impact their patient's health. And as we've discovered here over the past few decades, the actual medical care that they deliver impacts only a small percentage of that health status. So when people come to the emergency room or they suffer from a chronic illness, medical interventions do a great job of returning them to good health, but really we're often too late to address the root causes of that poor health that have been developing over time. And so the healthcare system has been letting down patients by not thinking about the bigger picture factors that impact their health. The shift to value-based care and specifically our mass health ACO model takes a number of powerful steps to correct this and to align incentives for providers to address these social determinants of health. Well, that really sounds great, but can you give me some examples of what this might look like for real patients? Uh, Absolutely. So let's start with a concrete example. Imagine a parent of limited means with a child who suffers from asthma, which gets exacerbated or worsened by the fact that their apartment lies directly next to a busy highway, so the air is not great. The exhaust and particulates emitted by the cars and trucks cause that child to have chronic asthma and frequent acute asthma attacks that end up sending him to the emergency room multiple times. So let's say this family receives coverage through Medicaid, and let's imagine that each visit to the emergency room costs Medicaid $1,000 and worsens the health of the child. But think about buying that family an air conditioning unit for, let's say, $100 that filters the air and could prevent those acute adverse health outcomes for their child that wind up sending him to the ER. Yet, previously in a fee-for-service structure, there was really no incentive or a way to pay for a simple non-medical solution to a very preventable medical problem. And in fact, Medicaid dollars were explicitly barred from being spent on those types of non-medical services. So value-based care arrangements are not necessarily limited to those restrictions, and they give the ACOs and other types of groups more flexibility And in the case of MassHealth, or Medicaid here in Massachusetts, we actually have funding built in to support these kind of expenditures. Really seems like a no-brainer to me. 
Right. So let me walk you through one more example of a social determinant of health that's much more complex. Um, This is the impact of unstable housing on health. So unstable housing is something that impacts so many people, especially in the Medicaid population, and it's been tied closely to poor health outcomes. There's a lot of research to show this. A report by the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare found that it costs law enforcement and the healthcare system, remember that, the healthcare system, $35,000 to $150,000 to process and care for one homeless person for an entire year. Yet, it costs only thirteen dollars to $25,000 a year to actually provide permanent supportive housing for that person. But convincing people that this solution is connected to the problem can be challenging. This is partly because the poor, th- out- poor health outcomes associated with homelessness and unstable housing are often indirect. They impact people's ability to gain employment. They increase stress levels. They impact personal safety. Uh, behavioral health management, medication adherence, and countless other factors. So they're indirect, but they directly affect the health outcomes. So I'm really thrilled to get to our interview today because we're going to be talking about this a lot more with Dr. Thea James of Boston Medical Center and hearing about the truly innovative and amazing work they're doing in the community around their hospital to address the challenges of unstable housing and social determinants of health that their patients directly face. Wow, this seems like a really complex problem. So why don't we jump right into your conversation with her and hear about what the experts are doing to try and address this for people in the world. Great. So let me um, introduce Dr. James to our audience. Uh, Dr. Thea James is an associate professor of emergency medicine at Boston Medical Center at Boston University School of Medicine and a practicing emergency room physician. She is also the director of the Boston Medical Center site of the Massachusetts Violence Intervention Advocacy Program and a supervising medical officer on the Boston Disaster Medical Assistance Team under the Department of Health and Human Services, which has responded to several disasters in the United States and across the globe. Dr. James is one of the foremost thought leaders in expanding the role of medical centers to address the social determinants of health. In 2015, she was appointed as BMC's first ever vice president of mission, charged with coordinating programs outside the hospital to help patients overcome hurdles of health. We are thrilled, beyond thrilled, to have her join us today and talk about the cutting edge work that BMC is doing and how organizations can think more broadly about their impact. Um, So I'm going to dive right in, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, So there's seemingly, and I say seemingly um, in quotes, more of an impetus on addressing social determinants of health issues now. Um, So can you talk to us a little bit about the history of how the social determinants of health came to be identified as important for the medical field and your experience pushing this issue? Okay, so I think that, um, you know, to add context to it. I mean, even if you look at it on a national level, our country spends more money in health care than any other country in the world. But our outcomes, you know, our health outcomes do not reflect a positive return on that investment. And so um, in Massachusetts, um, you know, for Medicaid, for example, the, the cost of Medicaid has been on a continued uh, upward trajectory over the past several years. And, uh, you know, the ACO came into B with the state hoping to sort of bend that cost curve and uh, to improve outcomes, decrease costs, um, and do that, achieve that by focusing on uh, social determinants of health because those are uh, considered to be the drivers of that cost curve and those poor outcomes. And so uh, it makes perfect sense. Historically, um, I would say that the proof of concept for me personally um, around that model to, uh, to, uh, to achieve those things has been through a violence intervention program we have had here for 12 years. And when Mayor Menino came to us and asked us to start that program, basically because our hospital receives more than 70% of uh, gunshots and stabbings in the city, um, despite the fact that there are lots of level one trauma centers in Boston, but... He came to us and asked us to do that. Um, I didn't know where to begin. You know, I did uh, volunteer with other people, um, t- you know, to champion it. 
I didn't know, you know, I had no precedent. So I started to do research around um, other hospitals that had violence intervention programs. There were only about three in the entire country, and one of them had begun to um, publish about best practices and um, measures of uh, uh, success. And when I was looking at the measures of success, there were things like measuring re-injury or um, reincarceration or dropped out of school. And to me, it sounded like they were relatively, um, they, they, they were looking at deficits yeah. and negative things versus opportunities and assets. And uh, that was also influenced by me looking at our patients when they came into the emergency department. You know, these young people would be in the trauma room and uh, you, you bare chested and, you know, you could read their tattoos and things. And the tattoos would say things like born to be hated, dying to be loved or living is hard, dying is easy or death is nothing but to live defeated is to die every day. And to me, it was a perfect storm. Here were these young people feeling as if there was no place in this world for them um, to achieve anything. And here we were, and I'm not saying we, but, you know, the papers I was reading, setting low bars for them. It's a perfect storm for uh, churning that cycle. And so I just decided at that moment that, you know, we decided we would, we would not set low bars for them. You know, we would have very high expectations for what was achievable with this population and, um, you know, uh, and so I felt like, so we've, the long story short is we've had very good success with that program. We now have both a housing track and a workforce uh, track. And we also have, um, the, we have uh, these advocates, we call them advocates. And the advocates are what would generally be uh, considered community health workers, for example. Um, but uh, they follow them, and they mentor them, and they engage them and get them to re- believe in themselves about what's actually possible and setting high, 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 high goals. And we have great outcomes. You know, with job placement, for example, BMC is one of our biggest employers. Um, you know, we hired a, a career specialist who does workforce training. We actually now do it even outside the hospital in the community, one of the community development corporations. And so, um, so I, it, you know, something like that to me is a model that can be translated to all of the patients. And I'm an ER doctor, so um, even beyond that particular population of patients, it's the same thing. You see it every single day. And so when we have interviewed those young people, we understand how those things happened. And they're all sort of like social things. And so... Um, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a lot to change the mindset of people around what is actually possible yeah. um, uh, to achieve with uh, vulnerable populations. And I would also say what's actually possible to achieve within an ACO beyond the clinical care. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you didn't ask me this question, but, you know, I think one of the things we'll have to be really, really mindful of as, a, as an ACO we have this opportunity with all of these resources given to us um, from the state, but we have to be really, really intentional ab- about not doing business the way we always do it. Right. Even beyond just you know setting higher bars, but also um, other things. You know, we do uh, you know the way we invest in things and extending ourselves into the community. All the things we normally do, we will have to actually. Um, be very, very intentional about doing it differently and um, seizing this opportunity to really affect change in a way that we have both a social impact, a business impact, and and um, an opportunity to see the return on the investment right. and change the trajectory of people's lives. Um, so... You're right, I didn't ask you about that, but I'd like for us to dive into that a little bit more. So can you speak a little bit about the intentionality of what BMC is doing in this ACO to uh, raise that bar to move out into the community? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, as, you, as, you, uh, as you probably know, we have uh, uh, delved into housing just a little bit um, through our determination of need obligation. And you know the determination of obligation is an obligation that um, the state says when you uh, build out on your, uh, your, your campus in any way that a certain percentage of that total cost has to be given back 
you know, to the community. Um, for the first time, we asked if we could do it in housing. My colleague work has and partner has been Megan Sandal, and uh, she does, you know, she is for, for a long time, decades, has done a lot of work in housing. And so anyway, um, you know, we asked if we could do it in housing, and we got permission to do it, and we wanted to do it. We didn't want to put all of the $6.5 million we had to spend into one project. We wanted to do multiple ones so we would have an opportunity to learn about what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And thankfully, it, it actually included, it give, gave us some opportunities to test the waters in another area, like investing. So, for example, one project was um, we invested in a healthy neighborhood equity fund. And that Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund is run by MHIC, uh, Massachusetts Housing Investment Corporation, and the uh, Conserva Conservation Law Foundation. And so um, there are multiple different levels of investors in that. But anyway, just to, make, uh, to, to, to move forward with that, um, this particular equity fund will only invest in developments that meet certain criteria that they get scored on. So they have to provide access to uh, affordable housing, employment, green walking space, transit, and healthy, affordable food. And so it invested in a um, eight acres of what was previously blight. It was an old bus depot. And now in that space, uh, they're building 323 units of new housing, both to own and to rent. Um, you know, it's uh, moderate, it's market, as well as affordable. And the contractors were very intentional in hiring people from the community as laborers on this project. Yeah. And then um, the people in the community wanted a supermarket in that space. Uh, we were unable to get a local one to come there that they had been attempting to, to get there. But uh, another one came um, to, 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 to mind, and there was one called Good Foods Market in Washington, D.C. It's very community-oriented. Usually when you want to build out your business and you you know you have to get loans and this type of thing with higher interest rates, we gave them a no interest loan to come to that space and build out that supermarket. And uh, we also provided them with some other um, funds to get things started, like hiring and getting a um, outreach worker from the store and that type of thing. And so they also hire from the uh, you know from the community, and they have a a food industry career track in the store. I've actually visited it in D.C., and that thing has like taken off. And those people who went through that track working in all other different places in D.C. And the last thing is that they are um, the uh, the uh, they they procure from local vendors, and so um, it's one of these things we've been interested in anyway because of a, a new organization we belong to that focuses on. It's called the Healthcare Anchor Network. You become an anchor institution for your community by focusing on hiring, procurement, and investment. So we were able to address all three in that particular one project of our uh, determination of need housing project. And the other ones are uh, working with community development corporations and others who own housing um, in Boston and providing services um, to people on site. And not, again, when I talk about services, um, we are sort of like not just like filling gaps. And that's what I mean about intentionality because we have lots of resources at Boston Medical Center, we, and we've always been nuanced and thinking outside the box and being creative. But this is an opportunity to not just use those resources and, and creativity to fill gaps for people, but to actually eliminate them. Yeah. You know, shifting from charity to equity. Yeah. You know, you want to get people out of the line of need. So that's one project. And then, um, and we, so we're, we're developing uh, um, lots of multi-sector partnerships within the community on various different domains of social determinants of health so that we can provide these various different uh, services and things for our, our patients to alter their trajectory. So, you know, we're looking at people in workforce development. You know, we're developing partnerships in food, um, education, for example. You know, various different things like that. We're developing these partnerships right now so that we can operationalize that into the way that we do our, 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 our clinical work within the hospital and being able to address the most acute patients as well as the rising risk of people so that they don't become the most acute patients. So inside the hospital, we have um, uh, to address the most acute patients, the patients who are the highest uh, utilizers of the hospital who are most unstable, who come in the admitted multiple times in a year, 
um, homeless patients as well. So we have um, created a complex care management team that is made up of community, we call them community wellness advocates. They have the same competencies as community health workers. Um, We call them community wellness advocates because we didn't like the name, the word workers, because when you are, and I remember this myself growing up, you know, when you are an underserved person living in a community, you will often have people like case workers, DYS, DCF workers, you know, social workers, all these kind of workers. And it, it, it sort of puts you in the position of focuses on a deficit versus an asset. Yeah. And so that was really the main reason why we wanted to change that to something more positive. So we call them community wellness advocates. But in fact, I completely champion community health workers. I love community health workers, just to be clear about that. I love them. Mm-hmm. But we just wanted to change, just to shift the name a little bit, just to focus a little bit more on the assets. And so um, they are in dyads with nurses. And in some cases, triads, because there are some pharmacists connected to that, too, because we understand how, you know, people not having access to medications and on a regular basis and that type of thing also contributes to their instability. And so uh, they work with patients inside the hospital, outside the hospital, and uh, this extends throughout our ACO all the way down to the other areas where, you know, where our partners are in the south and in the west and everything, and in uh, Brockton. And so, um, so that's another thing. And they have, um, you, know, you know, they have begun to see it, it, and it doesn't surprise anyone, I think, that when you give people that type of uh, really intense care and management, you can see their utilization drop precipitously. It's amazing. You, you, when you see these slides and they're showing the data, you can see how that happens. I mean, again, we're in a very, very nascent stage of all of this, so we don't have a ton of data yet. But um, the early data points that points to the fact that you know this type of intense management works. And I would say, you know, it is a very low threshold for be being able to engage a person because the population of patients that. Uh, we are serving within our ACO, for example, they're all Medicaid patients. I mean, mostly it's like um, the fact that somebody it cares and is actually interested in what is the driver of their instability is like shocking to them. Yeah. And they respond to it. That's great. It's just human nature. You know, they really respond to it. And it's kind of like the way I've always practiced emergency medicine anyway. When I see people, is the disease is like, you know, all that repetitious you know, admissions and disease, always unstable, same people all the time. Those things are just downstream consequences of the root causes upstream, yeah. like housing and lack of food and, and in many cases, social isolation, all those things. And so, you know, to to begin to alter the trajectory of people's lives and to mitigate and eliminate those things we're seeing downstream, we have to focus on putting our interventions there. So that's the co- uh Uh, complex care management team. We also have created something called a Thrive Screener that was developed from um, a WeCare screener from Dr. Arvind Garg, who's one of our pediatricians. And has been, you know, we altered it a bit. And so it's called the Thrive Screener. And it's um, social determinants of health questions. And all of our patients in ambulatory care clinics are now being screened when they come in. I think we've screened uh, about 33,000 people since it started. Um, they are not all unique. You know, some of them are have been screened more than once. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, and, and not so interesting because it makes total sense, you know, beyond housing, the things that people are screening, wanting help with most uh, in those clinics have been education and employment. Mm-hmm. So it's appropriate that we are reaching out to partners in uh, those domains as, you know, to help us to uh, fill those gaps with people. And so how, how, you know, how something like that might be operationalized within the hospital is someone who uh, identifies as being food insecure, you know, we have always been able to connect them to our food pantry. It was the first uh, hospital-based food pantry in the country. And um, you can all, you can write a prescription for them for every month, but in the perpetuity, I mean, you know, when does that change? And so t- the intentionality about mindset to, prov- you know, you have to just say, I'm not just going to send them there, but the next question is, why are you food insecure? Yeah. And that's where your main intervention happens. 
And most often, um, it's been income, because we had a student doing a study in the food pantry this summer, and she shared, yeah, I met with her every week, she shared some of the data with me, and income is definitely it. As a matter of fact, when she was down there collecting data and interviewing people, they thought she was there uh, for, for recruiting people for jobs, you know? And so, um, so, so w how that would be operationalized is when you, when you say that you're food insecure because of income, then we have a, a workforce development partner, you know, in various different industries and connect you directly to that person. And the other important piece is having the analytics and the infrastructure to actually follow all of these interventions that we're doing to make certain that we're able to see the impact, the outcome. Um, the return on the investment, where to redeploy and deploy and, you know, things in that way. You know, because it's iterative, you know. We'll have to, like, see what works and iterate these things just to make sure we're going in the uh, right direction and maximizing um, the impact we can have. Can I just add one more thing? Oh, of course. The, the, <laughs> the other major thing that's a little bit uh, – uh, it's not different in general, but a third piece to the housing thing is we're doing something in the community where we are giving out grants – um, around supportive housing to people. And um, we're trying to give everyone an opportunity to apply for this and not just have all the same usual um, actors doing it and uh, the same people who have the expertise and the resources to apply for these things. So we're, um, we're having, uh, we have an advisory committee to help us with this, but we're also, um, you know, we want to give people the opportunity to make proposals in the best way that they can. So we are going to be different things, like allow people to do them, you know, present oral presentations or, or things like that. And then on the back side, you know, we will provide them with technical assistance and things after that's done. So, um, you know, Children's Hospital also um, has made an investment in housing from their DON, and they're actually partnering with us. They've added a million dollars to ours to partner on this particular project of the, uh, the allowing the community to submit proposals on um, stable housing. That's really great. We often hear that the lines for housing are so long, so having a partnership with a healthcare institution must really help move things along. I mean, the partnerships have been great. I've <clears throat> never seen um, partnering among all the healthcare centers in the state the way it is now. We have a social determinants of health collaborative that's been meeting since May of 2017. And all of the ACO is represented, ACOs are represented at that table, you know, both including us, uh, C3, um, Stewart, everybody's at the table because we're all using this opportunity to learn from each other and to um, maximize our ability, all of our ability to do well throughout the state. That's great. Actually, I didn't know about that. <laughs> so thanks for sharing it. So we consider BMC a leader in the space of addressing the social determinants of health in addition to solving complex medical problems. What advice do you have for others, either in Massachusetts or elsewhere, who are trying to do the same? Yeah, I mean, I would say, number one, um, really be intentional about shifting your mindset about what's actually possible. Yeah. You know, really thinking beyond, you know, not to sort of... Uh, look at a population of people and say this is what's possible for you and set low bars because they will become self-fulfilling prophecies and nothing will change um, the second thing is having a historical uh, lens on why this exists anyway why people are in these positions you know understanding that um, people wind up being in, in these communities and these uh, specific zip codes and things were created from historical policies back in the 1930s, for example, redlining, yeah. where people were denied opportunities uh, for financial services to get things like mortgages, for example. I, I think that is probably um, the number one path to wealth, uh, building wealth in this country, and so um, which is what has created, I would say, that wealth gap that the uh, Boston Globe Spotlight team highlighted back in 2017. Um, and so when you're able to understand uh, how these things were created, how people wound up in these spaces, that sort of um, gives you an opportunity to see where you can actually make a difference and how you can actually change your mindset. You know, you have to just be disruptive of the structural barriers you know, that have created these, these uh, positions for people. 
um, be innovative, you know, um, uh, be intent on shifting the paradigm. I mean, it's all about, you know, change. And the other thing is like just being really, really collaborative with each other, with other people, um, not being like territorial, just like, um, and also uh, reaching out to understand the patients, not just relying solely on quantitative data, but use the opportunity to get the voices of the patients, which would be qualitative data, to inform the quantitative data. Because we look at the quantitative data and we make assumptions about why that is and we make interventions based on that without ever involving the people who have created that data. You know, for, I mean, they are, they are the data and they can actually tell you why that exists. Absolutely. And so, uh, I mean, the patients are an incredible resource for um, uh, helping you to understand their situation and actually giving you an opportunity to, uh, to, to mitigate it and eliminate it. That's it for today. So thank you so much for being with us. Oh, we really you. appreciate you taking the time. I love what Dr. James said about not just filling gaps for people, but aiming to eliminate them and shift the conversation from charity to equity. It really demonstrates the power that healthcare institutions can have to make lasting differences in the lives of people and that will ultimately translate into improved health and better opportunities. She gave us a couple of great examples of programs that the Boston Medical Center is investing in to tackle the root of patients' health before they enter or re-enter the healthcare system. I agree completely. These are programs that are showing a return on investment and really moving people towards health equity. She mentioned several examples like their violence prevention program, on-site food pantry, housing, and complex care management teams, uh, and, the, and the Thrive Screener. I happen to know that similar efforts are going on at other Boston-based institutions, so hopefully that collective effort will pay off in even bigger ways. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. So one thing I know about that Dr. James didn't touch on is how specifically Mass Health, the Mass Health ACO program is structured to encourage their ACOs to invest in addressing upstream population health challenges in their communities. How does the program enable not only big institutions like BMC, where there has already been a focus on this for years, but also smaller community health centers or provider groups and ACOs to make this a priority for addressing the health needs of the patients they serve? Right. Well, the the Mass Health ACO program really was designed with this in mind and modeled after other states that are doing similar efforts really well. So there was a significant amount of delivery system reform, incentive payment, or district money included in the Massachusetts 1115 waiver to the tune of several billion dollars, actually. And this is an allocation of significant federal funding that can be used to support hospitals and other providers to change how they provide care to Medicaid beneficiaries. And so they have some flexibility to spend this on a wide range of things from staff augmentation to infrastructure investments. And these can include things that will impact the social determinants of health. So just as one example, many organizations um, in this program are investing in community health workers to help complex care management with an emphasis on connecting patients who have environmental or community risk factors to community-based organizations that can help them address some of these non-health issues that they have that actually affect their health. Um, And then there's this other sort of uh, source of money to impact social determinants of health through this uh, Mass Health ACO program, and this is the flexible services dollars. And so for Mass Health specifically, a subset of that district funding was set aside as a pool of money for ACOs to offer things using these flexible service dollars, like housing support services, goods, and nutrition services to select Um, ACO enrolled mass health members, so certain people. And while the final list of approved goods and services is still waiting for CMS approval at the time of this recording, uh, mass health has indicated that the funds can be broadly spent on things like assistance in enrolling in different social services like home delivered meals um, and even home modifications and transport, just to name a few. So what can health leaders do to encourage their organizations to take on more of an active role in addressing social determinants of health? Like, let's say I want to turn my institution into doing things that that Boston Medical Center has been doing for years. Right. So first of all, 
I think healthcare leaders need to make social determinants of health part of the conversation. That's that's where we really should be starting. Traditionally, you know, uh, clinicians and doctors weren't really trained or encouraged to think about these things uh, when they're going through medical school. But like Dr. James highlighted, providers need to be screening their patients for these upstream health risk factors. And to do this kind of work effectively, healthcare organizations need to truly understand the population that they're serving. And to understand the population that they're serving, they really need to have good data on that population. Uh, Equally important, especially for small groups, healthcare leaders need to be aware of what organizations already risk it already exist in their regions to address these types of challenges that patients face and then actively go out and build partnerships and relationships with those institutions and those groups. Uh, Boston Medical Center, as we heard, is already doing that really well. Um, With their violence prevention program, they use workers that will go out and connect uh, patients that are at risk for violence with social services because they are in the community and they understand and have relationships with those types of organizations, for example. Um, We also advise organizations to think outside the box and be disruptive. Um, You don't have to accept the way that things have always been done or the rigidly defined dynamics at play in your community. So just to echo Dr. James again, don't set a low bar for what can be achieved. I I loved how she said that. And the hope also, especially with the amount of money that the government's pouring into the health system, is that investments in addressing social determinants of health will show a positive return on investment in the form of improved health outcomes and reduced utilization and cost. And when you show that type of ROI, then I think that this will spread more quickly. Absolutely. Really, it's about working smarter, not harder, really allocating those dollars at the root of the cause instead of thinking about using them as expensive band-aids later on. Well, uh, I really want to thank you all again for joining us for another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care, and we look forward to having you on our next episode. If you are interested in learning more about accountable care or how organizations can succeed in today's healthcare system, please visit our website, www.dayhealthstrategies.com, check out our blog, follow us on Twitter, and join our mailing list. We regularly post content relevant to current healthcare issues and overcoming challenges in delivering value-based care. Unlocking Accountable Care is a production of Day Health Strategies. Direction and editing by Max Blumenthal. Additional support and research by Emily Eibel and Nico Lehman. Our producer is Rosemary Day. Special thanks to Purple Planet Music for the use of their songs.